about how their son was let down by officials in the organisation he loved while competing in the sport he lived for. Here's guest reporter Robert Avaria. Nobody should die in this sport. This is not a sport where people should be dying. I'm always thinking about him. Every night, every day, just constantly, every time I drive. So much so that at times I've accidentally set a place for him at dinner. Yeah, there's just times that I just forget that he's not here. It was raining. It was really windy, it was cold, it was just coming from everywhere and I kept thinking, it's, perhaps it'll get better, perhaps it'll get better. The surf was quite extreme, it was breaking right to the outer bank. We all got there and we saw the surf and we were going, yeah, this is going to be an interesting, interesting Australian titles this year because, I mean, the surf was unbelievably big. March 2010. Wild surf fuelled by a cyclone in the Coral Sea crashes into the final days of the Australian Surf Lifesaving Championships. The cost could not have been higher as Surf Lifesaving Australia let down one of its own. As I said to the detective that night, Surf Lifesaving killed Saxon. And I'll never forgive them for it, for it ever. Happy birthday, dear Just move Saxon. Just Matthew. Happy birthday to you. And that other plate. Saxon Bird on his 18th birthday, just over a year before the championships. Wow. He was just too good to be true. Very sweet. Perfect son. When he was nine, Saxon began his surf life-saving career and quickly he found success. From the moment he was born, he was always in the water and it, it was just natural for him to, to, to go well in, in surf life-saving. He loved the training with his friends, he loved the water, he loved the surf. He lived and breathed it. He was one of the best iron men in our age groups and it was a real honour to race with Saxon. Patrick Nicholl was one of Saxon's best mates. Though they raced for different clubs on Sydney's northern beaches, they often trained together up to six times a week for the Australian Championships. I mean, it's the Australian titles. It's the last event of the year. It's the, it's the biggest event of the year. I mean, it was a bit of a rivalry. You are going for, the, going for a medal, but at the same time, we're all, we're all mates. We're all best friends. On the 16th of March last year, 8,000 athletes, including Saxon, began arriving at Currawa Beach on the Gold Coast for the week-long championships. Very quickly, the wild surf causes mayhem. By day two, Wednesday, officials are already fielding questions about the danger to competitors from the worsening conditions. Obviously, throughout tomorrow and then Friday, Saturday are probably the days where it does, it is predicted that the swell will increase in size and the conditions will worsen. However, we continue to monitor it as we go forward. Time after time. The safety to our competitors and officials is paramount and we're going to continue to monitor the conditions. And over the following days, safety of our competitors and our officials is the most important aspect. We want to make sure that the safety of our members is paramount and we'll continue to monitor it as the conditions change. The mantra never changed. I want to emphasise that safety of our members is paramount. We're continuing to monitor the conditions and we're confident we'll, we'll still be at Curra tomorrow and we'll continue to monitor the situation. Surf Lifesaving Australia has a lot riding on the championships. It's their showpiece, marquees, grandstands, television coverage, and millions in sponsorship, all centred around the annual event being held at Currawa Beach. And on the beach, on the Thursday, conditions were even worse, but the official message remained the same. We need to understand that safety of our members is paramount and our athletes, and we'll continue to monitor the situation. If safety was paramount, and you or any 
I mean, any normal person was standing on that beach and saw some of the things that were going on in the surf itself, you would say, what are these people doing? This is crazy. Glenn Holland, a boat sweep and 38-year veteran of surf lifesaving, remembers one race in particular on that Thursday. I saw two boats go over the top of one another and, like, cut each other in half. I just froze and I looked out on the water thinking, oh, my God, thinking, is they all going to come up? because they were moving at such great pace, it was like, oh, it was, you know, you could almost feel death. So incensed was he and others about the danger to competitors that late Thursday morning, the boat crews staged a mutiny, demanding their event be moved to a safer location. We've been training all year to do this. We don't expect to go out there in cyclonic conditions, and this is cyclonic conditions. We don't train in cyclonic... No one trains in cyclonic conditions. But at presently now, this is unrunnable for, for all crews. Also at the protest meeting was Midget Farrelly, a former world surfing champion and a competitor in the boat event. How unusual is it to refuse to race? It's... Very unusual. If you are working with the organisers, generally there'll be a consensus at the end of whatever meeting you have with them that, um, OK, we agree that there should, racing should be stopped for the day. Now, this was different. This was like um, you will race at any cost. There was... Uh, stretches coming down to the beach, guys were getting carted off, uh, injuries. I, the amount of injuries we saw, you wouldn't see in a whole year. You wouldn't see in two years or three years. Meanwhile... I want to emphasise that safety of our members is paramount and also that those injuries are not uncommon for an event of this size. Surf Life Saving Australia knew the dangers of pressing on. In the 1996 Australian Championships, 15-year-old Robert Gattenby drowned on the same beach in cyclonic surf. Senior official Grant Baldock is even reminded of the tragedy at a press conference. That's a plain mind, but when you're putting these two plans together... Obviously, we learn a lot of lessons out of um, that experience. And the strangest thing is, I actually asked Saxon who Robert Gattenby was the day before. As we were walking past the surf club, there's a, a memorial to him. The next morning, when Saxon and his parents arrived at Karawa, conditions had gone from extreme to terrifying. We were actually down on the beach at six in the morning, Saxon, Phil and I, and we could all see it was so much bigger that I can't understand that the officials didn't realise it had gotten so much bigger or just didn't want it admit to the fact that it had got bigger. But they kept telling the media that safety of the competitors was paramount. It was never paramount. If it was, if it was safety was paramount, why didn't they move it? Well, some would say this is Iron Man. It's supposed to test the toughest. It's a tough sport, yes, and that's what the challenge is all about. But there's a difference between tough and stupidity. Just after 7am, racing started for the day. On the beach, Saxon and his mate Patrick watched on. We were watching the best of the best, like the ones that do compete in the neutral grain, which is the top of the range people, and they were getting absolutely hammered out there in that surf. You sort of look at them and go, well, what chance have I got if that's, if that's what's happening to them? It's supposed to be racing, not survival. You and Dana were arguing, weren't you? Dana, you wanted Phil I to try to, to get them to stop it. I was, wasn't I? Yeah, I kept saying to Phil, please try and stop the race, please try and go down and make them stop the race. And then Surf Life Saving receives its biggest wake-up call of all. The Gold Coast's top-ranking policeman is so worried about the danger, he demands an urgent meeting with top officials. I expressed to them in no uncertain terms that I was very concerned about the safety of the competitors taking part in this event. At 9.55, Superintendent Jim Keogh, himself an experienced lifesaver, lays down the law 
to the Carnival Committee. I wanted them to take notice of what was happening around them and consider all their options. I made specific mention of the coroner and indicated to them that should there be a death, that's where we would be destined for the coroner's court, where the decision-making process by you know, the organisation of Surf Life Saving would be questioned. But racing continued and Saxon was worried. He was really just so nervous. He kept saying to me, you don't understand how hard it is. You don't understand. It's so rough and so dangerous. Just before 11am, officials were warned again. This time by Australia's top Ironman, Shannon Eckstein, who was approached by the chairman of the committee. Dave Thompson um, from Surf Life Saving come and saw me under the, the Northcliffe tent and asked uh, about the conditions. Um, I, I told him what I'd told the official earlier, that it was at the top end of my range. Um, it was pretty dangerous out there, and from, from what I've seen of the forecast, that it was probably only going to get bigger. They ignored Shannon. They ignored everybody who was telling them that things were dangerous and that those people are going to get hurt. On the beach, it is now a matter of minutes before Saxon's race is due to start. If it would have been uh, postponed or, or, or actually cancelled, they would have talked about it for a couple of weeks and it would have been forgotten. But here, you know, the events of uh, Friday the 19th will never be forgotten. I rang Mum and I told her he was going in the water. I had to start praying because I was worried. And then I had to ring and tell him that he was missing. I want the water clear. Before the Melbourne Cup, the Russian Ballet Company. September 30 and get a Puma voucher worth $300 for... Booth's boss. Booth wishes that you were going out with... is proudly brought to you by the Hyundai i40. Just before Saxon gets into the water, you, you make a phone call to your mum. Yeah, to say a prayer for him to keep him safe. I rang Mum and I told her he was going in the water. I had to start praying because I was worried. And then I had to ring and tell her that he was missing. At approximately 11.05, Saxon's race began. A wave pounded a competitor in front of him. He toppled and his ski became a torpedo, smashing into Saxon's head. And then he went under the water, and I kept thinking, where is he, where is he? And I kept looking, and I was... I told the official from the opens area, I tried, and I'm going, Saxon's missing, Saxon's missing, please. And this man said, get out of the official area or you'll be the, the competitor will be disqualified. And I said, there's a competitor missing, and, they, and he said, he, he's probably up the beach. And I said, no, he hasn't surfaced. I just remember turning left and right, and everyone, just the same, everyone, towels were off, everyone was in the water. Everyone ran down, swimming in the water, trying to find him. The cream of Australian lifesaving race in to save Saxon. But then, the an extraordinary decision. During the most critical time for a rescue, officials order them back out of the water. I want the water clear. Tell those swimmers I want them out of the water. That rescue was just dumber and dumber. They just... Saxon had no hope. It was just all white water. Saxon was on the bottom. How could they find him? It was impossible. If the swimmers had been allowed to stay in that water, and all those boys wanted to find him. They weren't going to find him racing around on jet skis and stuff. It's a body. He's full of water. He's under the water by now. He's sunk. The waves have pushed him to the bottom. I mean, 
where they're swimming with our feet kicking to the bottom trying to feel. They can't feel on a jet ski. They called us all out of the water. And at that stage there, I, I, I knew that um, he, um, he wasn't going to make it. I just knew, I just knew. But if they'd have left the swimmers in there, possibly he would have been found. I don't know. Some 50 minutes after they were ordered out, lifesavers were let back into the water and only then was Saxon found. It was 12.22. While he'd been missing, surf lifesaving had taken its swiftest action of the day to silence competitors and staff. Turn the camera off and move away, please. Have you heard that before Saxon was even found, people were being told not to speak to the media? Yeah, we did know. Yeah. The competitors had been told not to speak to the media. The officials had been told not to speak to the media. And Saxon hadn't even been found at this stage? No, all officials, there was a group of officials who were actually taken to a tent and given lunch while Saxon was missing. Despite frantic efforts, Saxon never regained consciousness. At 1.15 p.m., Saxon Bird was pronounced dead. The competition was finally suspended. Nobody is to enter the water today. Saxon's mum collapsed and was taken to hospital. You just go, in, go into shock. You just, you just can't comprehend it. A week later, Saxon was buried. Five days before his funeral, Surf Lifesaving Australia held a debrief for senior officials. These are the minutes. John Brennan, Championships referee. Believed the program as a whole worked well. Graham Bruce, Logistics Officer. Catering was good across the board. Don Van Keimpima, Support Services referee. Thought that toilet facilities were required closer to the officials' debrief area. There is not one mention of Saxon Bird. Publicly, Surf Lifesaving Australia was supportive of Saxon's family and friends. Uh, there's um, a lot of activity behind the scenes uh, uh, with uh, comforting and uh, communicating. Uh, so there's a, you know, our welfare of our people, as so we are an extended family, that's our primary concern as we get through that. And obviously our primary thoughts are with the family themselves. Privately, the real activity was to hire a PR firm to manage their compassion. Now, this is a memo that was forwarded to clubs the day after. I want you both to read that, please. In the memo, there are two suggested responses, one in the event of a negative inquiry. Thank you for your email regarding last week's tragedy at Where Is Australian Surf Life Saving Championships. We have been deeply saddened by this tragic death. And one in the event of a positive inquiry. Thank you for your email regarding last week's tragedy at Where Is Australian Surf Life Saving Championships. We will continue to support Saxon's family. We will continue to support Saxon's family, it hmm. says. Is that true? Do you find no, they supported you? not at all. <laughs> Anything but. And if anyone thinks they've supported us right from the start, our own surf club has, and they're wonderful, and I have nothing... I only have wonderful things to say about all the people there. But as far as Surf Life Saving Australia, nothing. Zero. They're there to protect the brand of Surf Life Saving. It's not trying to look at protecting the, the actual competitors. 42 days ago, we asked Surf Life Saving Australia for an interview with its CEO, Brett Williamson. A time and place was agreed. Then they pulled out. We asked Mr Williamson again and he declined. We asked a third time and he refused. But we set up for the interview anyway in the hope of a change of heart. The coroner would subsequently find that the only responsible thing for officials to do the day Saxon Bird died was to suspend competition. Dana Bird says Surf Life Saving's failure to do so caused her son's death. Life Saving managed to kill Saxon and then not even an I'm sorry. Do you think it would be an, an admission of guilt if they were to say sorry? 
I suppose it is an admission of guilt, but it's just the right thing to do. Well, so while we're here, here's to Saxon, a great bloke and a great friend. Cheers. Saxon would have turned 21 in November. In the early mornings on the waves, his son once ruled as an Iron Man. Philip Bird is out there. It's the only way I can stop, you know, just feeling down all the time, is to, to get out there and, and be in the water and, and, and having, using his, his board and, and wearing his, his vest just makes it feel like he's still with me there, you know, in just a little way at least, um, but he's still, he's still part of us. left everything of Saxon's is just the way it was. His room's the same, his clothes are all there, everything's the same. The only thing that's missing is him. Robert Avadia reporting there, and Surf Life Saving Australia has contacted Sunday night saying that it has great sympathy for Saxon's family and that it is implementing recommendations made by an independent panel after Saxon Bird's tragic death. You can read their media statement on our website where you'll also find the Queensland Coroner's Report. And if you'd like to comment on our investigation, you can join the conversation on Twitter or visit our Facebook page. Coming up after the break, the scientific experiment forgotten for 40 years.